Hi, I'm Margaret from Your Therapy Source, and in our last video, we explored what self-regulation is and why it's so important for kids. But how does it actually work in the brain? What's happening behind the scenes when a child controls their impulses, focuses their attention, or manages big emotion? So today we're going to talk about the brain science of self-regulation, kind of a bird's eye view on it. We're going to break down some key brain systems that help kids stay in control and how we as caregivers, therapists, and educators can support this critical skill. And don't forget, you can grab a copy of the first issue of Raising Self-Regulated Kids in an Overstimulated World at your therapy source. So let's get into it and start with the brain's role in self-regulation. Executive functioning is the brain's manager, and that's really at the center of self-regulation. And this happens in the prefrontal cortex. This region is responsible for decision-making, impulse control, planning ahead, things of that nature. Think of it as the conductor of an orchestra, making sure all the different parts of the brain work together smoothly. There are three key executive functions that play a role in self-regulation. We have an attentional control. So this is what helps kids focus on a task despite distractions. This involves the prefrontal cortex and the parietal lobe, which processes sensory input. Inhibitory control allows children to resist impulses, like waiting for a turn or stopping themselves from grabbing a toy. This function is managed by the prefrontal cortex and the basal ganglia. Then there's working memory, which is the brain's notepad, where kids temporarily hold and manipulate information. It connects to the hippocampus, which is crucial for memory formation. When these executive functions are strong, kids can stay on task, control impulses, and make thoughtful choices. But when they're still developing, or in adults may be disrupted by stress or overstimulation, self-regulation becomes much harder. All right, there's also effortful control, and this is about choosing goals over impulses. Effortful control is what kids allow kids to pause, think, and choose a goal-oriented action instead of reacting impulsively. The prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, the brain's emotional center, work together to balance emotions and decision-making. The amygdala reacts, it triggers an emotional response like frustration or excitement, but the prefrontal cortex steps in to evaluate whether that reaction is appropriate. So for example, when a child wants to shout in frustration, effort for control, effortful control helps them pause and choose a calmer response instead. Here's the key. Effortful control doesn't develop overnight. It's shaped by early experiences and supportive caregivers, co-regulation, who help children learn to pause and regulate their reactions. When adults provide a structured, emotionally safe environment, it strengthens these brain pathways, making it easier for kids to resist impulses and focus on long-term goals. The third thing is emotional regulation, and this is about balancing big feelings. It's what helps kids handle stress, frustration, or excitement without becoming overwhelmed. And it involves the limbic system, particularly the amygdala, which we've spoken about. This, is, this detects emotional threats and triggers the fight or flight response. The vagus nerve, which connects the brain to the body and helps control the stress response, is also involved in handling emotional regulation. So here's how it works. When a child faces a stressful situation, the amygdala sends an alarm to activate the body's fight or flight system but the prefrontal cortex and vagus nerve work together to calm things down, helping the body switch from a heightened stress state to a relaxed rest and digest mode. The best way to strengthen emotional regulation, co-regulation with caregivers. When adults model calm responses, provide emotional support and teach coping strategies, kids build those neural connections they need to manage emotions independently. So let's talk a little bit about that, about how kids develop self-regulation over the course of time. Self-regulation isn't something that kids are born with. It's just not there in their brain right away. It develops over time through biology, environment, and key life transitions. So in early childhood, ages zero to five, the brain is highly malleable, making early experiences so important. Predictable routines, play-based learning, and warm, responsive caregiving help lay the foundation for self-regulation. Then as kids get older, and when they reach that adolescent period, the prefrontal cortex is still developing. So this is why teens can struggle with impulse control and decision-making. Self-regulation becomes more complex, involving long-term goal setting and identity formation. So mentoring, structured independence, and skill-building activities help strengthen self-regulation skills during this stage. 
And even as adults, this is a skill that we're always working on in this overstimulated environment that we're living in. But let's talk a little bit about the impact of mismatches. When the environment, like I'm talking about, doesn't support self-regulation, sometimes a child's environment can work against self-regulation, making it really hard for them to stay calm and focused. Two major challenges can include adverse childhood experiences, chronic stress, inconsistent caregiving, things like this can disrupt the development of brain regions responsible for self-regulation, so it can lead to difficulties in managing emotions and behaviors and overstimulation. Excessive screen time, pack schedules, constant noise can overwhelm a child's sensory and emotional systems and adults, making it harder to focus and stay calm. So what can we do? We can create supportive environments. This is really important. This might mean reducing overstimulation when possible, providing safe, predictable routines that help kids feel secure, encouraging self-directed play, which gives children the chance to practice self-regulation in a natural, no pressure way. So self-regulation isn't just about teaching kids to control their emotions. It's about giving them the tools to manage their thoughts, actions, and feelings in a healthy way. By understanding the brain science behind self-regulation, we can better support kids as they develop these skills. So just to review quickly through structured support, co-regulation and intentional teaching, we can set them up for success, not just in childhood, but for life. So if you want more insights and strategies, be sure to go to yourtherapysource.com and look for that raising self-regulation kids in an overstimulated world. Issue number one is available. And don't miss the next video in this series, how sensory input shapes self-regulation. I'll see you there. And thanks for watching. If this video was helpful, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe for more insights on self-regulation and child development. Let's continue raising self-regulated kids in a world that truly needs it. See you next time.